Conradine Stars, and welcome to the Legends Interview Series. Um, I'm Ant Lawrence, and this week we are going right back to where it all began. And we're going to have a chat to Marty Varner, who was the bloke who put it all together. So all of our friendships, all of our connections, all of our stories wouldn't happen if it wasn't for this bloke. So I've been looking forward to chat to Marty because when we started coming up with the idea of this series, I said, I want, to be, I want to get him on our screen and hear about how it all started because we've got some great traditions and it started with this bloke. So I know a few of you as well gravitate towards episodes. You go, oh, I know that bloke, so I'll watch that one. If you haven't heard of Marty or you haven't spent much time with Marty, spend time here because this man is a very humorous, very engaging man and it's worth the price of admission. And let's be frank, the price of admission for this thing is just make sure you grab it for you. So enough from me. Let's get straight to it and welcome... Our Godfather, the original Marty Varner. Welcome to the episode. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a joy to be here. Joy to be here. Now, and look at your beanie. What are you wearing? I'm wearing a Q beanie. Um, I still go down and watch uh, about you know, half a dozen Q games a year. Still know quite a few people there. So uh, there you go. Now, Marty, you would, if you've seen previous episodes, you know I've been around it probably per end. Jumper, that's what I've had at home. I've got a little treat for you today. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's yes. nice. Look at this. I'm trying to make you feel a bit more at home. There's the forefather. I Very good. If you, could, if you could just put a Toscano over the top of the HFC, it'd look even better. But that, that is quite right. superb. Well, I, I couldn't get hold of I couldn't get hold of a um, Q jumper yet, and I'm still working on that because Q's changed colours. They've, they've got the uh, Richmond sort of shape about it. But I've actually went to another clubby legend, Matt Davies, who runs SE Products. So he looks up. This is the this is the eighty eight eighty nine signed jumper by Hawks. It's there back to back. So if anyone wants any, we'll do a cash for comment here. If anyone wants any memorabilia, Matt Davies official memorabilia at com dot au. Gears chuck that up there for me, and uh, happy days. But that's enough about that. But thanks, Matty, for this. Marty, do you, do you still catch up the old mates and talk about where this all began? Yeah, absolutely, very much so. Um, look. The whole genesis of this was uh, a lot of my mates at school had weren't playing footy when school finished. Oh, I, I um, got called up. A mate of mine was captain at a club called McLeod Rosanna in the Diamond Valley. So I spent a year, um, well, uh, after playing at Xavier where your opponents would shake your hand before the game and uh, moving to the Diamond Valley where oh, they'd give you a cuff over the year. It was a, it was a cultural difference to say the least. But um, you'd get the pleasure in those sort of leagues of um, fat club presidents would, would come and sit next to you and give you a watch or 10 bucks at the end of a game. And so you felt like you were a bit of a superstar, but then you often thought, is this really worth it? Is this, is this kind of atmosphere really where I want to be? So, um, yeah, I was kind of dreaming of the day where I could have a footy team where my mates were playing and uh, which had a bit more of a social culture about it. Rather than coaches telling you how shit ass you all are, just something that was a little bit more, a little bit more civilized. So um, after one year of that, the following year I wasn't going to play footy at all, and then uh, and then I applied for a transfer to play in a, another league. The club blocked the transfer. The bottom line was the only places you could go was the amateurs. So uh, mate was at the amateurs playing Q under 19s. Ended up in the Q under 19s. Uh, got talking to Ian Job, who was on the committee there. And the club had, the club wanted to become a big club. Now, one thing about being in the under 19s, it gave you access to club 18 matches. So they often were the curtain raiser to under 19 matches. And I just saw these quarter time and three quarter time blokes with cigarettes and ventilants taking them both simultaneously. And there'd be all the support stuff with beer in their hands. And I just thought, you know, this is the sort of footy that, that really appeals. So put the idea in the club manager's head, uh, Ian Job, that, you know, Q ought to have its team in this. And uh, over the summer, there were a lot of discussions at committee level and the club was going to get a whole team together. I said I could supply six players. It turned out that the club supplied one player and I had to get the rest. So so, I, so my brother brought down six. Uh, Michael Manley brought down six. Um, I brought down plenty. And... Uh, all of a sudden, we're playing a practice match against a club called Richmond Juniors, which who subsequently beat us by 28 goals at Citizens Park in Richmond, which was a fun day. 
<laughs> sure it was. How did, you, how did you manage to get a team together? Like when did you uh, get well, a lot of phone calls and a lot of playing on. But so some some of my mates were playing at other clubs. So I got Kevin Doyle was a really good footballer. I got him out of Monash Whites. Um, Paul Shaw, I got him out of Uni Reds. Uh, Mick O'Hanlon was playing at Camwell in the VFA. I got him, and uh, it was just. I mean, I was still seeing these people socially, but I could and and through university, but I was seeing the day where oh, you wouldn't be mates for much longer. So it was just uh, a lot of phone calls and a lot of boozy chats about oh why you should come and play here. And in the end, who could say no? I mean, what's it's much more fun playing with your friends than than playing with bars or so. I mean, if you're going to go through the amount of pain. Wear a stupid outfit in, in on a, a stupid skimpy outfit on cold winter days and go through all that shit and uh, and you know why would you do it? Why why would you do it in a, in a in an atmosphere other than one that's a congenial one? And so you know we gave a perfect congenial atmosphere. Training was magnificent. Circle work and kick to kick. You don't need anything else. <laughs> Two way circle work on big training nights. And, and that was it. And, and then pizza and beer. So, yeah, lovely early days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that would, obviously, there's some traditions in play. So, you obviously, when you build a new team, new club, you've got to think of, you've got to set your new parameters or your, the social settings for you, for the club as well. Absolutely. And the key is um, aim low and achieve. And so, the first thing was just getting on the ground was good enough. And in the first game, to give you an idea of some of the players we, to make up the 18, one fella had come from his job as a, a bowling alley mechanic, and he didn't have any boots. But he had, so he bought some he bought some nails on the way to Citizens Park in Richmond, and a hammer. And he was hammering what he thought would be his stops into his work boots. That's Dave Lorisella. <laughs> so we had to stop him before the umpire came in to check the hands and boots thing and just say, uh, "No, mate, I, I think you're just going to have to wear the <laughs> your work boots and." Get around, but that's the sort of stuff we dealt with early on. It's great fun, hilarious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the first game, um, yeah, they came out all tattooed big and they were going to kill these, you know, all of that sort of stuff and sort of looking up at them and say, yeah, I think you are too. And during the first lap, it was pretty apparent what was going to happen. But when the score was one goal each, I think I was feeling quite chuffed about it all. I was in the ruck thinking, well, this, this might be a bit of a game, but yeah, one goal each, and then they kicked the next 14. Mm. And uh, and it wasn't half time yet. So, you know, it ended up being well, 30 goals to two was the final margin. Um, but we proved that form to be a lie in round, when we played them again in round two, and they only beat us by 27 goals. So, you know, we obviously improved a lot by over, over a few week period, but ended up making the finals in that first year. Did you? We did. We. Um, you got a few new players and got a little bit organised. And so after losing three of the first four, we then won a, had a run of 10 wins in a row and uh, got into the finals and lost the first semi-final to Old Brighton, who won the flag. Well, there you go. That's And did you find recruitment quite easy once your philosophy started coming through, the, the bags and the beers and the pizza? Yeah, absolutely. Um, once, once we'd had the practice match and blokes were seeing it, uh, this was this was really social footy at its best. I mean, we used to do stuff in the in the rooms. You know, your traditional club in their warm up, they count to ten and jump, ten jumps and ten push ups and that. And then from that started the well, while they're doing that, we'll just stamp our feet and count to ten in a, in an aggressive fashion to make it sound like we're doing the same thing. And and uh, it was all that rubbish. So. And we'll make them think that we're a very strong, aggressive side by um, playing tough music. So we used to just have a, a nice, loud sound system and just put ACDC and Rose Tattoo and stuff like that on there because they didn't know we were a bunch of Nancy boys. They had no idea. So, um, you yeah, know, that would hold true for... A, and being a Q side, they thought you were a traditional Q side, so they were expecting to wear a few. Mm. And, uh, mm. yeah, th that got us through the first few games without getting terribly beaten up because... Um, they really didn't know what they were up against. So, yeah. Yeah, was, yeah. Uh, and, and, um, so we spoke just before this interview, you talked about a no dickhead policy in the team. How did that come to play? Well, that was just straight up. I mean, you want to have fun. So you want it. So from training to Saturday was, 
every night was a night of the pub. So Wednesday night, training, pizza, pub. Thursday night, all get together, pub. Friday night, pub. Saturday, game of football, which had finished by two. And then you, you're at the club, if it's a home game, till at least six, then pub. And so you're in each other's pockets all the time. You, you don't want to suffer dickheads. And so, and having no dickheads just made it much easier. It's, and you didn't want to be people doing stuff that would just embarrass you. So, you know, eccentric's absolutely fine and encouraged. Aggression is fine too. If, if it's kept in its place, it's a good thing. But um, just someone who's, you know, any, any, anything that's, that's too... Uh, I'm trying to think of a word which is not coming to mind. I'm getting old. But, um, yeah, you just got to keep it in its place. Everything in... in um, well, not moderation... Certainly drinking not modern in moderation, but it, uh, acts, ridiculous acts. Someone who's a dickhead, basically, you don't want them around. I think, I think we all understand that, I think. And that has carried through from day one, and I think through to today, I think we've benefited from that that plan you put in place from the start, I reckon. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, it did make life a lot easier because... Uh, yeah, we did, and a few blokes didn't like it, and a few we we showed a few the door, and and, and some had you know some extremely colourful characters showing the door. One fellow who uh, ended up biting the the thumb off a policeman, <laughs> you know, it's Dave O'Neill who uh, played one game for us and got reported in the first five minutes of it. He had a, a rather, a, uh, yeah, agricultural approach to the game, so he took on two. Um, Sandridge players, and he was uh, reported, suspended, sent off, and uh, we just thought uh, that's enough for you. Thanks very much. And then, yeah, within a month, he's he's inside. So yes, oh, yeah, oh, colourful oh. characters. Colourful characters. Now speaking of colourful characters, you got to play with your brother as well. You mentioned him at the start, so your brother Tom. Yeah, oh, superstar. Uh, one of the greats. Um, he had a yeah he he had a colourful approach to the game. He he was a bit of a he was our first enforcer. If you look at our first year, uh, I was twenty one years old twenty. So Tom, at being at twenty two, was uh, the second oldest player in the team. So he took it upon himself to be the club defender, and uh, it was good because he he looked like he meant business, and so people would tend to back off if and uh, and he picked his right marks too. You don't go near the, the enormous tattooed uh, Neanderthal. He, he would pick his mark, but yeah, it was good having one or two who knew how to handle themselves. So, yeah, yeah. but he was yeah, he was yeah. fun. He came up with the club word. So I've heard this mentioned nearly every in one of these things. Tommy came up with the club song in year three because um, at the end of games, the club song had been a mishmash of things, one liners to. Um, I think the King, uh, Return to Sender was the club song for, for a while there, for, for no real good reason. But, yeah, then Tommy just came down one day, he penned these words, handed out copies to everybody, and, and there you have it. It's still a club song today, I understand. So, when, so talk us through day one, that song, did it just feel right? Day one? The, when the, the, first the time song, did you say? You. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just the bit... Beer, bourbon, vodka and gin, um, fine combination. Uh, it, it just said it all, really. Uh, and Because it really was a grog culture and, and a get-together culture. And of, of the... So I guess we, of the Scott of 26, I'd say 22 of us were catching up at least three times every week. Mm. And um, of, the, of the original lot, probably five ended up meeting their wives-to-be through the footy club. And it's just... Well, because we were all about the same age. This is the thing. When you're kicking off, we're all kids. Whereas as the club moved on, you, you, had, you had age disparity. So you ended up having 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds together. But, you know, when, when we started, absolutely all of us were aged between 20 and 22. Yeah. So, you know, it was, so we were easily the youngest team in the league. And, uh, you know, when games got nasty, yeah, we were pushovers in that sort of business because we just didn't have the size or the, the experience or the wherewithal to handle that particularly well. So, um, so yeah, we just got beat up. But we'd win the games. We'd win all the close ones because I think that's the, the beauty of playing with your friends is you just you, you do go a bit harder. And uh, it does get you over in close ones. It, it doesn't hurt, that, put it that way. 
No, and I think because you've got to trust your mate. So you see a mate in strife, you, you, you'll go the extra yard to tell them that as well. Yeah, you will. And, and, and you know you know what they can and can't do. So you don't set them impossible tasks. And you know who to kick it to and how, to, how they like to get it and, and all of that sort of stuff. It all helps. So, yeah. But the footy, as you, you know, as I'm alluding to, the, the footy's two hours of the week, but we're together for a lot more than that. And so, you know, the footy was great. It was a focus, but, um, yeah, there was a lot more to it. It was a real bonding exercise. And so, yeah, I'm still mates with, uh, with say, 80% of the people who, who we played with over that time. So, and I'm sure you are too. Yeah, Would that be right? Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Um, and I think when you go in there as mates in the first place, you create a stronger bond and then you, your mateship only gets stronger thereafter. So, but absolutely. Um, tell us about you as a player, Marty. I mean, this, let's get to you as the core. What, what, are we, what would we have seen? Champion, schoolboy, 7th, 18th footballer at Xavier, held down the centre-half forward, the important centre-half forward position for two consecutive seasons, top the goal kicking, uh, for two seasons in a row in the 7th-18, uh, was a member of the uh, the Premiership Black House 1980 side, which were ranked eighth uh, of the eight houses and uh, won the Premiership. And I, I played full back in, in that glorious moment. I, After school, a mate of mine was captain at a club called McLeod Rosanna and, and they're under 18s. And so he invited me down there. And so, yeah, that was quite a quite a cultural change. Um, my first game was against, uh, what was it, Melton South, and I'm on a skinhead. So that was quite a change from playing against someone from Scotch. So you learned a bit about the rest of the community doing that. Um, and then Q and the 19s, well, that was, uh, I guess um, I've got a WOG name myself, but uh, my first, I had to play my first game under a false name before, before I got properly registered. It was, my surname was Harolan Bopolis. That was pretty good. Well, yeah, a lot of, remember that. A lot of letters in that. Yeah, Foddy Harolambopoulos was my name. What and, was your signature uh, like? Oh, yeah, that was just a. That would you make sure you got plenty of, of that um, of that liniment on your hand as you're writing, it and just, you just smudge it right through. So yeah, and it, the other one needs was okay. Um, yeah, it was a lot. It was pretty strong football. I don't know if you played Amber under under rider. Other than, Amateur under 19s was quite fast, was pretty good footy. But yes, but the, the pinnacle was to come. In, in the club 18, I was the ruck. I was probably the shortest ruck in the league, but just showed you how small our team was. So I played ruck. And uh, in those games where we were getting beaten by 28 goals, I was resting at full back. So, you know, because in the side, there was only six of us who'd been playing footy since school. So I had to, yeah, ruck and full back. Uh, that was a great rest o on a fella who was covered in jail tats uh, called Jeff Matthews. So he was a, again a lovely, colourful character. Yeah, it was, um, it so uh, yeah. that's your your career. So tell us then about some of the great players you played with. Who oh, were well, the standouts? The king, the king in the early years, Kevin Doyle. Uh, he was a star. He, he was. If you if I got the the hit out, you just go for Kevin Doyle every time. He just uh, break a tackle and kick the ball both feet 40, 50 metres. He was just the player and a wonderful abuser of his teammates, of the umpire, of the opposition, everybody, and uh, completely self-centred, <laughs> uh, completely self-focused. But yeah, Kev Kev was the star. There was a fellow called Andrew Peters who played up forward. Um, he was the pretty boy, blonde guy who the opposition would target, and uh, but he was a he was a good footballer. He ended up he ended up captain coaching in a club called East Brighton in whatever league that is. So yeah, he he, he was he was very good. Uh, Richard McIsaac, very solid fullback, and he ended up bringing down you know four thousand McIsaac brothers. But so um, yeah, he he was in the seventh eighteen with me at school, and he blossomed. Uh, when he got to the club 18. So he held down full back magnificently. He wasn't in the very first game. He, he joined halfway through the first season. And uh, John Somerville was a, a beast of a, he was about 17 stone. Um, he replaced me in the ruck late in the first season. And he just had all knees and elbows of former rower and a missing front teeth, front the missing a front tooth, which gave him a hell of a lot of credibility. So he used to, 
smile at people who were uh, trying to intimidate anyone. He, he was very handy to have in the side. So, yeah, they're they all they're all very good. At the end, Matt Dalton joined the side and gave it a bit of Hollywood. He used to commentate himself. And, uh, I mean, anyone, who, I think most of you have seen him on TV and know a bit about Matt Dalton. Well, we haven't talked about that because we haven't covered that off, mate. So, uh, most, most oh, well, Matt Dalton... Is- well, man, Matty, Matty gets it. Matty gets around him. Matty's got around him again. Matty's making him look stupid and he's saying it. And his opponent is a metre away. And he balk him gratuitously two or three to Matty top. But it didn't matter because he's talking to him the whole time, commentating the play. And then Matty puts it through. And then he has to pat the guy on the head as he runs back to the centre to get the bats on the back. He's got a yeah, complete nut. He joined... Um, he joined on a regular basis in about 88, but he, he played a couple of games as a 17-year-old. Um, he, got, he came down with, with a Mackayzak, of course. Yep. Chris Mackayzak mm-hmm. and Rob Mackayzak were mates of his. Yeah, so, yeah. So, One stage there were five Mackayzaks. He was a 100-goal kicker, wasn't he? He kicked 100 in a season? No, no, he didn't kick 100. He, I tell you, he would have gone close one year. So, uh, there was a... A uh, centre-half back from Port Colts called Spider. Uh, Matt had three goals in the first three minutes of a match, of first versus second, and Spider got sent down to do a job on him, and Spider, Spider did the job on him quite well because he was going to kick. He was going to kick a ridiculous amount of goals that day, yeah. but he's I had covered over. But he's credit; he stuck the game out. He played it out. But uh, yeah, yeah. So follow it through then. So he's a commentator on the field. For the blokes who are now part of the club and won't know who he is, where would they see him? Well, what, what they they think who's this mad bloke who's playing next to me? So he'd be he'd be full forward to centre half forward, and as he's moving in, you, the ball's being kicked to him. He's going. He's this is I'm quoting. Maddie's about to fly. Maddie flies. He marks it. He lands. Looks around. Feigns a handball. Plays on. Puts it through, and then he'd run over to the opponent, put him, I bat him on the head, and then you know walk back to the position. And so, you know, he just uh, fantastic, fantastic fun to watch. Yeah. And uh, what a if you're an opposition player, you just want to kill him. He wouldn't do it against sides like Port for no. obvious reasons, no, no, no. but that against your safe opposition, no, yeah. That's right. Yeah, it, it was so very what cool. I'm to, what, sorry, what I was alluding to is he's on TV these days, so the current crew can Oh, sorry, yeah. Well, he's on Gogglebox. His family are the... They're, they're the... Uh, well, they're the arch-type Turek bunch, I would know. So him, him with the wife and the three daughters, that, that that's uh, Matt Dalton. So if you're turning into Gogglebox, you'll see him there. That's right. So yeah, not, not the same man. Yeah. <laughs> not flying on heads. He was... Mick O'Day no, 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 but Jesse could play. Yeah, I heard, I heard yeah. that. Heard yeah, that. he could play. So tell, tell us about some of your favourite matches, memories as a player. What sort of stood out during oh, your look, career? Some of the stuff, I mean, you, on-field stuff comes and goes. Oh, look, I'll talk about some, being on the tribunal of the club, O'Day. When, when we started the, the competition, when we started in the comp in 83, it wasn't part of the amateurs, which is why you could drink at games and stuff. So you had to have a tribunal when each club had to have a tribunal delegate. So I was the delegate for Q. And the tribunal was held at a pub, was held at the, the, the Riverside Inn in Richmond on, uh, in Hoddle Street. It doesn't exist anymore. It's been knocked down, but it was really funny. You, the tribunal would have to go there at six and, the, and you'd start hearing cases at seven. So you get there at six, me and a bloke from Port Adelaide called uh, Port Adelaide, Port Melbourne, Daryl Degenhart, and the other one was a bloke called Steve Butler from um, St. Kevin's. So the association shouts your beers while you're there. So we have three pots well, well, and chalk about what's coming up for the night. And then you moved into the ladies' lounge as you see the bloke with the, the bloke with whose eyes covered over rolls in. So you can see, oh yeah, victims arrived. All right, we'll move into the next room. And then you move into the next room, sit down in your panel, and then you call the, the, the order would be, uh, Umpire first, then victim, then aggressor. And you're hoping that the victim and the aggressor don't go on with it in the public bar. But anyway, that it never happened when I was there, so that was all right. So you sit there and the fellow, <laughs> the umpire comes in, gives his version of events. But before he starts, you always ask, do you want a pot? Or I'm just going to get a pot or I need, someone needed a piece. It was just the most magnificent tribunal. Justice at its very best. 
So I was very much the hanging judge because I reckon to get reported was really difficult in those times and I'm sure it still is because no umpire wants to go there. So I thought if an umpire reported to you, you did it and, I, and I'd always say four weeks minimum. And then you had the Port Melbourne fella who was opposite saying, oh, there's nothing in it. Oh, no, there's, there's nothing in that. But he's obviously just fallen over. And then, so it always came down to Steve Butler's decision. There's no need having the three of us, but we were there for free piss yeah, on, a yeah, Tuesday, yeah. on a Tuesday night. And um, and then, yeah, you'd, you'd hear the three different cases and it was just sensational. You get the, the sanitised arm and they would use the same vernacular that you'd, you'd read about if you were reading a, a VFL tribunal report. So, you know, um, the umpire would speak extremely formally and uh, talk about your player Lawrence used his right arm and uh, switched back and struck him uh, forcefully to the forward region. You know, he's speaking like this as you're drinking beer and smoking cigarettes and just trying not to laugh. It was just absolutely magnificent. And the guy who's got blood all over him will come in and he's going to do one or two things. He's either going to be a squealer or he's going to be a, there was nothing in it guy, you know, because that's what you did in the VFL. And so um, so we used to have a little bet, side bets among us in the tribunal. Was, oh, I'd see him outside, squealer for sure, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, so, yeah, with, being on the tribunal was a tremendous thing. You called up uh, you know, generally only once or twice a season, but you'd get some fantastic cases. Or like, um, yeah, Sandridge... As a club were reported, I got to hear that one for attacking old Melburnians with chairs. Now, Fair enough. I don't know if you've ever played against old Melburnians. Didn't know the crew Sorry. played them then, but I would do it. I would do it these days too. So, fair enough. The Melburnians. Oh, I don't mind. Oh, most back teams, then, I don't mind most teams, but I hate that anyway. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Oh, that's good. I mean, I'd, I'd like to know. They've obviously um, toughened up over the years because they were the they were weaker than us. <laughs> no, they're, no, they're not tough. They were just pains in the asses. Pains in the asses. Whingers. Winders. Yeah. Well, screen. anyway, so that, that was the tribunal. So that was some of the stuff I got to do. And then um, being on the being on that committee, I got to nominate players to play for the association team for matches against. Portsy officers camp. So you'd find a fair few Q players got to play in the association for the Club 18 Association, we the blue and white. So uh, so Kevin Doyle would get in. Of course I'd get in. Didn't matter. Okay. They'd have two teams. I'd just play in the seconds. Uh, and uh, you'd have a wonderful afternoon out at Portsy Officers Camp where where beer was like 20 cents. Because oh, they didn't pay any tax. Oh, life was good. Life was good. And oh, so <laughs> I reckon you would have looked at the record and been so thrilled when some a tribunal case has come up. You'd be going, you beauty, we're on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, drink driving wasn't wasn't quite the uh, frowned upon in the same way back in 40-odd years ago as what it is these days. So you tended to, whilst you, you know, you certainly didn't want to, don't encourage it. No. Um, you, 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 um, yeah, you, you did tend to get yourself home from those things. Uh, Five back streets. Oh, yes. Happy now, days. There's, there's a couple of premierships in your career. Yeah. Let's hear about those. Uh, 80, 84. So, in the second year, we were in it. So, first year, we made the finals, which was a really good effort. Uh, and then the, the second year, we got a few more players on board, and we had a, we had a pretty strong Division Two side. <laughs> and uh, we only lost one game in the whole season. So, that was St. Bernard's away, and that was only by a goal or two. So, um, that was a good win in because in the grand final, St Bernard's had, you know, they had lots of blokes in their thirties. They were your traditional old style club at inside. A lot of hard boys who'd retired and wanted to keep playing, and um, we got away from them in the second quarter, and they just couldn't make it up. And in the last quarter, they spent the whole quarter trying to just intimidate us out of it. So there was lots of, lots of behind the play stuff going on. But it's, yeah. so winning it made, made it extra special. So that that was good. We'd hired a bus for the day, so pretty much we had. Uh, Got to the club, left our cars at Kew. The grand final was played at um, near the Junction Oval in in uh, uh, St Kilda or Alba Park there, Ross Gregory yeah. Oval, it's called. So we had the team bus uh, take us down there and um, loud music on the team bus, lots of beer and stuff. And then the team bus, the team bus trip back was great. So we we did laps all around the area of Kew so that the adoring public could welcome <laughs> us back. Into the metropolis, and um, 
And one of our fellows had just got his first lot of tats that week and they happened to be a pair of bloodshot eyes on his ass. And he was he was poking, yeah, Tony Gibbs was poking his eyes out at all the public, anyone who cared to see. So that, that was, um, and then that evening just was uh, completely out of control. Uh, a, 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 tr a magnificent evening's entertainment at the club. Most of us stayed the night there. Um, you grab a piece of carpet and you just slept under that eventually. And, uh, but yeah, there was a lot of, there was a lot of regurgitation to clean up the next day. It was a bit of a, yes, in the club, but the seniors came for their uh, best and fairest. They were having their count the following day and we, we didn't really leave it in the best of condition, but you know, um, they were prepared to look beyond that. So uh, yeah, now, the a club great would have day. Been thrilled. You've gone from one day to club all year, the committee thrilled that you've been in the, in the organisation for 12 months or two years and you've got a flag and then 24 hours later, that's all thrown out the window. Well, pretty much. Yeah, well, it was, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But um, they did still, the, the relations were pretty good because, uh, got, again, after all the home games, we'd get the opposition at stay, we'd stay, and there would be a substantial amount of money on the bar at the end. So... That just meant we got left alone. Yeah, and so relationships were kept being cordial to the, the extent where, I mean, when Tom and I stopped playing club out there, we, we stayed involved at Q. I, I was umpire in the reserves for at least five years. Tom coached the under 19s and the seconds. So I still got friends down there. And I still as I said, I still go down and watch games. So it was a, it was a pity that, that um, Q became Paran. From my perspective, it was a pity. But, um, as long as you keep the same principles, so they're simple principles. Hmm. Footy's to be enjoyed, not endured, all right? There you are. It's the deepest thing I'm going to say, but it is sport. All of sport is to be in, enjoyed, not endured. If you're not enjoying it, don't do it. No. And if you if you throw yourself into a, a club sport, a sport, a sport like footy, which is, which is full of adrenaline, a bit of danger, and... Uh, a real sense of achieving things together. You, you, you can't help but have a great time, can you? It's, it's just a, it's a wonderful combination. And footy clubs are fabulous places, but they're only as good as what you make them. So you've just got to do your bit to make sure it's a great place to be. It's not that hard, no. but you've just got to do it, you know? No, that's right. So and good on you. And I reckon with the, um, as you said, with the, the way you've started, with, you've started with, the club supplied one bloke, you collectively supplied 25, 28, 30 blokes. That sort of friendship base has maintained its way through. You, you end up just having good people around and it's just a fun environment to be, especially in this environment here. Absolutely right. And then you've got to have the... Because, you know, at a, at a, at a traditional club, a coach gives an address, right? I don't know about you, but I used to just be thinking about anything but what they're talking about because they're just talking rubbish if you're winning you're playing well and if you're losing you're weak and it's just it meant absolutely nothing so um some of the coaching talks we get would be hilarious like tom used to use props so if we're playing a monash uni he'd wear a mortarboard and talk about the yellow peril trying to invite <laughs> trying to invade our shores we were playing them on the weekend of anzac day weekend and, and he gave us this magnificent time about why what we should do to defend our country and um i guess you had to be there but he did an evangelist one against uh zavs one day so he put on his his finest martin luther king accent and just told us all we got to believe oh. and uh, turned a turned a five goal loss to a to, to a goal win and, and it was just like yeah, he, he, very spontaneous at times and very set up at other times, but but always amusing. And so you listen to that because it's fun, you know. Yeah, Whereas yeah. the the traditional, you know, the traditional crap, I mean, really, who needs it? No, that's right, that's right. Um, so down the down at Q to this day, the yeah. third eighteen best and fairest wins what? He wins the Tom and Marty Varner Award. So there what you go. Honor. What an honour. Oh, it's a lovely. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, very nice of them to do that. So it's, it's not because we were great footballers, as, as I'm first to admit. Um, but yeah, because we used to put in a bit around the place. So there you go. And that, and that was it. So they invite us to the BNF every year. 
we take turns on who has to go and some some years we don't go because you know b and f's are notoriously dull evenings as as i'm sure you're aware and do but, well, um, well, it depends. two of them two of them in my memory were quite entertaining but the rest of crap so anyway well that's a different story um but i reckon it's it's something that i think we should be all taking forward that i think we should have the marty varna tommy varna award traditionally carried through into our side as well because as i said without you two blokes and all your mates we ain't here talking like this well look it's thank you very well i mean whatever you should decide to do but um Look, as long as you're having fun with it, and that's the key. Look, if, if, if it's rolling on the way that it used to roll on, it sounds like it is, and the way that blokes talk about the games, and, and it, it's all kind of relaxed, and yeah, then may it roll on forever. All footy clubs should be like that. Like, after footy finished, I mean, after my shoulders just completely gave way, I started playing cricket for no other reason than I could have a cricket club and started the cricket club. And it operates under pretty similar kind of kind of rules. And we start each game with nine slips. There's different captain every week. Um, grog during the game. We've been warned countless times by the association about you know grog and stuff. But but they let us go because we generally we've got a no sledging. We just sledge each other mercilessly, but we leave the opposition alone, and so we can so we get away with a lot. That cricket team's a nice local club with a nice local name. What's the name of the yes, team? Yes, yes. Barnawatha North Cricket Club. And we play at uh, Faulkner Park in South Yarra on, on turf. Beautiful. D-grade turf. That's the way to play cricket. Uh, completely re completely relaxing atmosphere. All different. Again, all different abilities. And um, and this is different in that, uh, in that there's not one demographic. We've got people from 30 to 70 playing. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Anyone who's played cricket say in England has played Sunday cricket in England if, if I was going to compare to anything it's like that yeah. it's you can get anything can come into bat next anything can come into bowl next and it's 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 pretty civilized you know so it's good yeah. fun yeah terrific now so for my era my era yeah. of playing we I played in the 97 premiership yep and we got together 20 we got together a few years ago to watch the 20 year reunion the, the reunion to watch the grand final and I think over time people have built that memory into the game. It's been a terrific game of footy and we played really well. And they got a horrible shock when they watched it and four goals beat three goals in a nine degree sideways rain day. And we didn't need that to make the standard any less. The one thing endured for us was the commentary effort. And you were our commentator that day and your commentary effort was first class. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, <laughs> I got invited to do a few of those commentaries and, uh, yeah, we, you had to colour it in because it's not your fault the standard's rubbish. Uh, it's the fault of Elstonwick Park, don't you think? Oh. It's a shit ground. Oh. You can't play a good game of footy there because it's windswept and slippery and you don't know where the boundaries are. So you, you probably find that if you've um, taped any of your other games, they'll actually won't look so bad. But any game played there, I don't think I've ever seen a good game played there. No, so uh, don't blame yourself. But yeah, commentating was a lot of fun. I didn't know many of the names. So just, uh, yeah, we just made stuff up as we went along. I think I was with Richard Lindsay, wasn't I? Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Good fun. Uh, congratulations fun. on a magnificent win. Oh, yeah, that you, was um, against... It's good to keep the uh, traditions going with the Premiership, so... Well, uh, when did you last win? 99. So... 99? We went across to France. So it, it was... It was, it was on a run to 84, 89, 94, 99. And we've sort of, we went up right to provision one and we've got close a few times, haven't quite got there. Yeah, it's those, those nasty zabs, is that right? Who just seem yeah, to win it every that's year. That's been the downfall. That's been the, it's, it's, it's likened to the, probably like the ashes, I suppose. We've been born out of them, but in, in this case, we actually can't beat the mother country. Hmm. Anyway, yes. one day, one day, we got close. We got close a couple of times. It'll happen. It'll happen. No, no, we had, we had our own nemesis. It was called a club called the Bloods, who were uh, a bit of a, a mix of um, uh, Old Brighton and, and Haleybury and got blokes who just formed their own club. And they, they had a few ex-AFL players playing or VFL at the time. And uh, for our first four years, we just couldn't, couldn't beat them, couldn't get near them. And then finally cracked it uh, in 89, beat them three times. and 
they couldn't believe it either. And so, you know, you just you just keep chipping away. You just just treat every game like the today's going to be the one. We used to always go five times as hard as at any other club as when we played Bloods. And, yeah, and eventually, yeah, eventually the damn wall cracked. But, you know, it, it, it took a while. Did it crack? It Did it crack in the last quarter of the semi-final in 89? I think you were down at three-quarter time and you stormed home. You've got a uh, you've you've got some good information. Uh, yes, um, yep. The uh, rapper and Tony Wilson kicked a couple of goals in the third quarter, and then um, and then ran all over him in the last quarter. And in the grand final, uh, Paul Colts did us a favour in the in the preliminary final by working them over pretty hard. In the and so on by grand final day they were pretty much beaten. So it was a a comprehensive win in '89. So, so that that was that that felt pretty good. I mean, I guess the the reason that we really didn't like them to start with in the very first game against them, you know, you do the traditional post match, the captain goes into the other rooms with with a few cans of beer, etc. Well, he came into our rooms nude. And, you know, I just thought, oh, no, that's a bit disrespectful. We don't need to see that. And then did the old, oh, you, yeah, you know, you're you're good blokes. So congratulations, I've been in the comp look forward to playing you for a long time. It was so he, then he walked out. I just thought. Well, can't top being nude, but I went into their rooms and just said a few sarcastic kind of words. I, I wish I could remember them. They, they came naturally at the time, but yeah, we just thought we've got to beat these guys. I, we anyway, they, they had a few glamour glamour players as well. I said the uh, AFL guys had um, some of the guys from Australian Crawl were playing for them, and so they had yeah, and they had the they had the best looking birds following them too. I had to say uh, a bunch of bunch of cute blondies would roll up each week and they'd, they'd be having prawn cocktails mm, whilst we're yeah. serving prawn cocktails. We, we'd be serving, yeah, we'd be just having your traditional pies heating up in at our place. But they'd, they'd bring along a, a, a truck which had champagne and all this sort of stuff. And so, yeah, for their posse, oh, yeah, they were ahead of it. So they, they did a lot of things right, I've got to say. Yeah, but they I don't exist them. anymore. Yeah, no. Yeah. I hope you use them as a bit of a model to, to work towards on the way through and yeah. learn on the way. It's good. Exactly right. No, no. Co cocktails are a good idea. If you could get a cocktail mixing set up at Tipperan, you could expect to... Uh, you, you'll increase your amount of uh, supporter engagement uh, a lot, immeasurably. And happy, knows, happy spouse means, means the good players get to keep playing. So, you know, there you go. We all know that. So Marty, what what have we missed on the journey? Were there any other stories we can add to this? Oh, look about footy games. I mean, it's 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 quite a while ago, Ant, and and um, I can tell you about wins and losses, and and you know, and getting beat up at Port Melbourne, and and um, and people with uh, anger management issues. I guess the, the main anger. Yeah, one of the worst things ever taught to one of our players is Paul Shaw got taught Taekwondo at, at Melbourne Uni. And he decided to use it every week once he learned it. So by about the, so him and a fella called Stephen James and a fella called uh, Andrew Holton would just, they would just take it out on the opposition on a fairly regular basis. Very, very, very calm, sophisticated guys off the field, but on the field they just had the worst case of white line fever you've ever seen. And you've met Andrew Lazarus. I'm sure a lot of you would know. Yep. Clearly the maddest guy um, of, of love him to death but but completely mad and um he was captain coach for a while and i remember just sitting next to him one game i just came along to watch and he's coaching and he's wearing one of those john kennedy john kennedy type coaching coats and a small a small incident on the wing hardly anything in it that says q st bernard's and he's immediately jumped the fence and throwing haymakers and i just thought this ain't gonna look good from a club perspective so I had to get onto the ground and get him off before the umpire came around to the to settle things down. And so, and then he sits down, calm as pie, and saying, "That was fun, wasn't it?" Yeah, you know, he was wonderful. I, I, he took out a full he took out a full back from an opposition when he was goal umpiring one day, because the the bloke had the temerity to question one of his goal umpiring decisions. And so that that was our last. Year. But could take screamers, could kick both feet. Had a, Amazing ability, and and a very calm guy, but completely mad, and and a, a great Q teammate is all I can say. He's, he's a star. Well, like he's a player, but he did have that edge about him. So my Laz story, my Laz memory, 
played against Thornbury Cougars. So they were your pork colt equivalents for us when we played a pretty rough and tumble. He's kicked in later style a banana from 40 that sailed through the goal. Boundary umpires go, Whoop. sorry, mate, you're out of bounds. And it was a goal of the year by a long way. And he's turned around and says, are you some sort of spastic? Unfortunately, the poor kid who was bound around pouring was a little bit mentally challenged. And so therefore, oh, no. all in brawl off it goes. Oh, no. <laughs> and it just, that, to me, that summed up Laz, the brilliance of the, the other side straight away in one moment. Oh, no, the man lives on the edge. And, uh, yeah, we've had a few who live on the edge. Um, but, but um, yeah, I, I don't really have a lot to add in terms of... Because a lot of what's been said over... The, I've watched four of these things and, and you really cover it. it. It's really more than the footy. It's the other stuff. And so you are making friends for like those of you who are playing now. I don't know if it gets said every week, but enjoy every minute of it because, um, you know, it does go. And unfortunately, but yeah, but the friendships endure. And so, so just find ways to catch up afterwards, be it a cricket club or be it whatever it is, but um, just find ways. And uh, yeah, you the, you're better off having been involved at a club for a number of years than, than the poor losers do haven't. Team yeah, sports right. are wonderful yeah. thing. That's right. So, that's right. yeah, that doesn't that's sound right. particularly right. But I don't have a magnificent repertoire of writers' uh, things. I, I can tell you some of the most moronic things coaches have said to me and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, you've all heard all that sort of shit. So I don't really need to. I don't, I don't think I really need to. Um, but if there's anything in particular you want to ask me, far away, I'm an open book. Uh, no. oh, the last question I was about to ask you is the message for the guys today. And I think you're sort of getting to that territory now. Is just enjoy yourself, boys. That's it. Um, the moment that it feels like a chore, get out of there and just enjoy it. Enjoy it for all it's worth, every part of it. Don't When the game's over, don't head straight home. You're missing the whole point. The point is catching up with all these other people that you've just been through. You know, you're the closest of, that we have to, to being in a front line is this. And so mm -hmm. you, you, that's why you, you make these lifelong friendships out of it because you've been through all this shit together, uh, good days and bad. And you, and you, the talk about it goes for three times or four times as long as the actual games themselves. So, yeah, watch, watch old replays. Enjoy them. I just found the, a replay of the 84 grand final, which... Um, which is on video, sadly, not CD. So we're going to, or DVD. I'm going to have to get something because <laughs> it'd be very tough to watch. But I've got some old photos and things. But I, you know, photos are no good for this sort of medium. But um, yeah, anyway. we'll chuck, send them through. We'll, we'll add them through. We'll, they'll be in this video. You chuck a few through. We'll, we'll intersperse. Oh, happy, happy to do that. Yeah, happy to do that. But anyway, hope I haven't bored you to death. But no, um, no. Cool. Nah, nah, yeah, yeah, you haven't got the best of Tommy out of this. And I, I just really don't know how to, to describe him. Tommy would go on the Q footy club end of season trips. The club and then didn't need an end of season trip because we were getting pissed together four days a week. So we didn't really need it. But Tom would go on the club end of season trips and, and his fearlessness on those, or you'd come back without eyebrows as you do. But he would get the meanest guys. Like Q had some pretty mean fellas in the 80s were known for it and uh, one of whom you know still has the record for most weeks suspended in in amateur history tony perry and tom my brother managed this fella took one of tom's eyebrows so tom had to get revenge and full marks my brother is on his aiming skills and what he was prepared to do how low he was prepared to stoop but he left the ultimate bomb tom left it a turd in one of his socks and so this fella got back from the footy trip, took his whole bag and ran to his mother's house for her to clean it up. So the time bomb, the time bomb was quite a magnificent and uh, yeah, quite a colourful character, my brother, Tom. <laughs> Oh, that's tremendous. That's tremendous. It's not bad, well, yeah. Well, I think, you know, the better, best way to end on one of these interviews is on a turd story. So <laughs> we're part of a jumper. That's, that's one half of it. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, I've still got uh, sort of, well, black and yellow firstly, but brown and gold blood. But uh, good on you too, Blues. Keep the attitude up and just keep going and enjoy it. Enjoy every minute of it. 
that's there you right. go. Well, that, that's a good message for everyone out there. So, so Marty, thanks very much for today. I mean, as, as I alluded to at the start, none of us are doing this interview series. We, we've, we haven't got the amount of friendships we've got. We haven't got the memories we've got. If you didn't start doing what you did in 1983, that's endured for 500. I'm trying to work out how many people it is. A thousand people rolled through this team over time is because you had the foresight when you're 21 years old started. So we thank you for that. Thank you very much. And uh, long may it continue. No, Cheers, Ann. Good stuff. Um, we'll sign off there, team. So thanks, Marty, for, for all that. That is awesome. Um, I hope the guys who are playing today get a real sense of what this club's been about and how it became what it is today. So thanks to Marty for doing that. And remember, boys, we are the mighty Club 18. Good on you, Marty. Good night.